have been in a series called Church Health Matters. Church Health Matters in 1 Corinthians. We've been journeying through the book of 1 Corinthians, and we've been looking at uh, this book through the, through the angle of church health. Not because the Corinthians modeled what church health looks like, but rather because the Apostle Paul was casting vision for them and what it's to look like, what, what healthy church is to look like, what, what a church with order, with love, with grace, with, uh, with wisdom uh, from God looks like, them operating within that. And so last week we talked about depending upon God's power. And we saw how the Apostle Paul came to the Corinthians in Acts chapter 18. He came in weakness. He came in fear and much trembling. And he was, he was able to acknowledge that. But he was dependent upon the Spirit's power. He depended upon the power of the gospel to change lives. And he wasn't going to try to come like a philosopher of their day and try to reach them with eloquent words. He came with this dependence upon the power of God and the spirit of God to move in the hearts of people. Because people come to faith not because we have excellent arguments and excellent reasoning and excellent speaking skills. But people come to faith. Because the Spirit of God brings conviction and raises dead lives, dead hearts, and opens blind eyes. And the power of the gospel, as it's proclaimed, the Spirit moves in and penetrates the hardness of hearts and changes people's lives. And so we are a people here at City Church who are committed to centering on the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and depending upon His power the power of the Spirit and the power of the gospel that has changed our lives. And we put our confidence in the power of God to change others' lives. Not an Easter egg hunt, not our, not our coolness, or, or not um, anything else, any other technology or, or aspect of human wisdom that we can heap up or achievement that we can heap up to say, look at how awesome we are, look how much we know. Our, our faith is to be dependent upon The power of God. And so this morning we're going to talk about uh, being a people of the Spirit. Being a people of the Spirit. Now when you think of a spiritual person, who is the most spiritual person that you know? When you think of a wise person, who's the wisest person you know? Or when you think of a spiritually mature person, who's the most spiritually mature person you know? And what is it about them that, that, that makes you think that they're the most spiritual or they're the most wise or they're the most mature? A lot. So the Corinthians had an idea of what spirituality looked like. They had an idea of what it means to be spiritual. They had an idea of what wisdom looked like. And it was a worldly idea. They had an idea of what maturity looked like. And so they would use these terms and the Apostle Paul stepped right into their, their world and he used some of that language and he helped redefine and reshape the way that they saw themselves and the way that they saw the world around them. Namely through the lens of the gospel and through grace. The Corinthians were a people who considered themselves to be spiritual. However, however, their their spirituality, they weren't as spiritual as they thought they were. They weren't as advanced as they thought they were. And the Apostle Paul was helping deflate their ego where they were thinking more highly of themselves than they ought to. And he was giving them a lens through which they could look at themselves and look at others and humbly serve God and depend upon the power of God. Of God and the wisdom of God. In this section, Paul uses uses these terms like wisdom, mature, spiritual, and he and he redefines their understanding of that. So, First Corinthians chapter two, starting in verse one. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come to you proclaiming the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ. And him crucified, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. 
And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he cannot, or he is not able to understand, because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but he himself but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understand, understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let me pray. Father, as we dig into this rich portion of Scripture, would you open our eyes to see wonderful things? Would you open our eyes to see you? to see the gospel clearly, to see ourselves, to see what you have given us in Christ, to see that we possess now the Spirit of God who lives in us, the third person of the Trinity. And would you encourage us and empower us as we aim to do your will? Would you be with me now as I aim to build up your people, edify your people, and exalt the name of Jesus here. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So here's our big idea this morning. God has made us spiritual people by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit who reveals divine wisdom, leads us into spiritual maturity, and transforms our lives. God has made us spiritual people. How many of y'all have heard somebody say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual? Okay, that's, that's a common, common thing today. And, and often we got to kind of ask, what do you mean by that? Not religious, but I'm, I'm spiritual. Spirit, being spiritual can be a little more cool than being religious, right? And so there's misconceptions about what being spiritual is, whether it's just like, I'm open to all religions, I'm spiritual. Or... Um, or if you're, you've been brought up in the Pentecostal tradition, I speak in tongues, I'm spiritual. Or like the Christian church, I speak in tongues, I'm spiritual. But Paul is talking about the spiritual people being synonymous with those who have the Spirit of God. It's also connected with those who are truly wise and those who are mature. And so it was ironic that the, the Corinthian church considered themselves to be so spiritual, but Paul says, you guys aren't acting like spiritual people. And I couldn't address you as them in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. And so we see that the people of the Spirit, first of all, are dependent upon God's power. In verses 1 through 5, we see Paul modeled what it looks like to be a person of the Spirit. Here's a spiritual person. He wasn't dependent upon human wisdom and philosophy and techniques. He wasn't trying to use worldly methods or mere natural methods to reach people. He was dependent upon God's power. 
And as one theologian says that the way he came to the Corinthian church was kind of like a paradigm for Christian ministry and the Christian life. This is how we are to live with this dependence upon God's power, acknowledging our weaknesses. It's okay that we're weak and frail because God's power fits perfect in our weakness. And we can acknowledge that. We can trust that he will give us what we need to do what he's called us to do by his grace. And so we see in verse 5 that his aim was, was to get the Corinthians to have their faith not in the wisdom of men, not to be so shaped by Corinth in the Corinthian culture, but be shaped by the Spirit and shaped by the power of the gospel. And so Paul reminded them in these first verses of his approach, as Warren Wearsby says, his approach, his attitude, and his aim. His approach was a determination to just simply preach Christ crucified. He wasn't going to try to be like the modern day eloquent speakers and philosophers. He was just going to preach Christ crucified. Though Paul was a very sharp guy and, and was, was, was trained theologically and knew the scripture, he wasn't going to depend on his natural strengths or his, his natural training. He was going to depend upon the, he's dependent upon the spirit. And he told the Corinthians, imitate me later on, imitate me. As I imitate Christ. His attitude was one of, of, of humility. Acknowledging his own weakness and fear. Because it wasn't about him. It wasn't about him being strong and presenting you know, his strong side. So that people perceived him to be as stronger than he really was. And his aim was that the Corinthians would be dependent upon God's power. So what we, what we also see in verses 6 through 16 is we see that the people of the Spirit operate with God's wisdom. There's, there's, there's two ways of operating, two perspectives and ways of operating in this life. We can operate according to the way of the world, or we can operate according to God's ways, according to God's wisdom. And this is what he pointed the Corinthians to. They considered themselves wise and sophisticated, educated, Craig Bloomberg says that there is a wisdom that all Christians have by the mere fact that they have the spirit living in them. But it is appropriated only when they yield themselves to the spirit rather than act in accordance with the desires of the flesh and their fallen human nature. And so as I wrestle with just kind of how do I how do I describe how do I articulate what is this wisdom that that Paul's talking about? I, I I describe it as this that it's it's having a mode of operation that is shaped by God's perspective. You see, we all have a way of doing things in in a in a point of view that we operate out of and we operate from. And, and what, what Paul is calling the Corinthians to is to operate from God's perspective, not worldly wisdom. One commentator says that believers have the capacity to bring God's perspective to bear on every aspect of life. Now, sure, surely it's true in Isaiah where, where God says, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. My, my ways are far high above. My thoughts are high above your ways. Okay? In, in, in contrast to sinful man. But what he, what Paul tells us here is that those of us who now have the Spirit of God have the thoughts of God and the words of God revealed to us. And we have truly become spiritual people because if because we have the Spirit of God dwelling inside of us. Now, it doesn't mean that we always act like it. And the Corinthians sure didn't. And that's, that's, that's the, 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 what we call sanctification, that gap between who God has made us and how our position, our identity, and how we're actually practicing and walking out who he has made us. And Paul is calling the Corinthians back over and over to live out who God has made them. He says stuff like this when it comes to sexual integrity. He says, 
in chapter 6, he says, you have been bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body and your spirit, which are God's. You are not your own. You've been bought at a price. You belong to God, so now live like it. This is who you are. You are the temple of God. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that you and I, saints, possess the Spirit of God inside of us? So let me look, let me just uh, contrast the two different wisdoms here, the, the origins of it, the operation of it, and the outcome of these two different wisdoms that Paul is talking about, these two different modes of operating in. First of all, one comes from the Spirit of God and the other one comes from man. One's earthly, the other one's heavenly. One is spiritual, the other is natural. One is of this age and the other is ancient wisdom the the operation of the wisdom of god is an operation in love the operation of the wisdom of man is an operation in selfish ambitions the operation of the wisdom of god is in humility versus arrogance contentment versus envy and jealousy interdependence versus independence team collaboration versus competition the me or the we mindset. We have the mind of Christ. We versus me mindset. The service mindset. The mindset of serving others versus performance. Look at how amazing I am. And so Paul gives a whole chapter. I mean, he get the whole letter. I mean, you just see Paul trying to help the Corinthians center on what matters most and live according to the Spirit and live according to the wisdom of God and the ways of God. And it's the Holy Spirit who leads us into this fruitful life of Christ-likeness, who convicts us. We can quench the Spirit. We can grieve the Spirit when we're not walking in love or kindness or forgiveness. Theologian Anthony Thistleton says that there's one kind of so-called wisdom that is pretentious, self-affirming, and seeks to operate by means of human achievements. And there is a God-given, received, revealed wisdom that nurtures and directs the life of the people of God, and in in sometimes hidden ways also the world as God's creation. And so there's two, there's two modes of operation. There's two ways. James hits, uh, t- um, taps into this, this concept in James chapter 3, 16 and 17. And he describes wisdom that's, that's earthly, demonic, and sensual. That causes envy and strife and confusion. And he says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of good fruits. And mercy without hypocrisy and without partiality. And so what Paul highlights here within this section is that it's the Holy Spirit who imparts that wisdom that we need. He's the one that gives us the lenses through which to see the world and ourselves and those around us and to see God. He puts the spotlight on Jesus and he helps us to see ourselves accurately and see God more clearly. Paul quotes Isaiah loosely here, kind of paraphrases. As it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor uh, the heart of man imagined, what, what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, I'm thankful it doesn't stop there. But he highlights that the human eye, the human ear, and the heart to understand, nat- the natural person can't grasp this. They can't grasp Particularly the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, which is the wisdom of God manifested. But verse 10, he doesn't stop in verse 9 after he quotes this. He says, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. Isn't that amazing? You see, when you became a Christian, your spiritual eyes were opened to the good news of Jesus Christ. God, the Spirit of God convicted you of your sin and showed you that you need a Savior. 
and you put your trust consciously, you put your faith in Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. And there was some change that had has, that took place then and is continuing to take place in your life. And the Spirit of God is the one who's transforming us and changing us. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says, But we all with, an un, as, uh, with unveiled faces are beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. And so the Holy Spirit's leading us into this spiritual maturity. The Holy Spirit is leading us into operating in the wisdom of God versus human wisdom. And of course, this isn't automatic for us. We have to, we have to let this mind be in you that, that was also in Christ Jesus. We have to keep in step with the Spirit. We have to respond to the Spirit. If it was automatic, the Corinthians would have, would have been uh, bearing a lot, lot better fruit in their lives. So we have a part as well to respond to what He does reveal to us. And we are to renew our minds through Scripture and through the influence of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And Paul goes on and he says, For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that man which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. You see, we believe in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That, that God is one, three persons in one God. We hold to that truth. And we get the third person of the Trinity to live inside of us. We've become the temple of the Holy Spirit, the the house, the home for the Holy Spirit. And Ephesians 1.13 says, you've been, when you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You see, this is what we get because Jesus died for us and purchased our salvation, and there's lots of benefits, grace upon grace, that comes along with that salvation that we have in Christ. And Ephesians chapter 1 does a great job unpacking that. But it's the Spirit of God who imparts that wisdom, who reveals that wisdom, who leads us in to being truly spiritual people in practice, not merely in position. And so also what we see, this wisdom, we see the outcome of this wisdom. The outcome of this wisdom is unity instead of division. One of the reasons why the Corinthians were experiencing divisions amongst themselves was because they were operating with the wisdom of man rather than the wisdom of God. We see Christ's exaltation versus self-promotion when we operate In the wisdom of God, we see edification versus tearing down when we operate in the wisdom of God. We see, oh, made a mistake. We see healing when we operate in the purpose of God. And we see hurt when we operate in the the, the wisdom of the world. We see peace when we operate in the wisdom of God. And we see strife when we operate in according to the wisdom of this world. We see an advance of the mission, our witness being more effective when we follow God's wisdom. And we see a hindrance of the mission when we operate in the wisdom of man. We see order when we operate in the wisdom of God. And we see chaos when we operate in the wisdom of this world. We see health when we operate in the wisdom of God. And we see toxicity when we operate in the wisdom of this world. And so there was chaos, there was disorder within this church, and the Apostle Paul was trying to move them towards order, towards health, towards unity, towards love, towards edification. And he was trying to do so by centering them on the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, manif- the, the wisdom of God manifested through the person and the work of Jesus We see what the Apostle Paul in in chapter 2, verse 6, describing the nature of this wisdom. He says, yet we, yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Although it's not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret 
and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they, for, for if they had, they would, have, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And so this, this wisdom of God has been hidden. But now in Christ, it's an open secret. It's, it's hidden to the world, to the natural man. But to those who are in Christ, it's no longer a mystery. It's no longer a secret. All of the people of God have the spirit of God and God has opened our eyes. We see it, Chapter 1, the Apostle Paul said, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, spirit, people of the Spirit depend upon the power of God and operate in the wisdom of God. He said, And because of Him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. Jesus is our wisdom. In Colossians 2, 4, in him are hidden all the, the riches of wisdom and knowledge. He's our point of reference. He's the lens through which we see ourselves in the world. He's our standard in the mode of operating, of operation and living. In him we live and move and have our being. Christ is our life. He's our source of wisdom. He's our source of righteousness. He's our source of sanctification. He's our source of redemption. And this should humble us. This should humble us in our progress and in our achievements and in the good things that we see coming from our lives. We can't say, look at how amazing I am. We ought to say, look at how amazing God is. So we boast in the Lord because he has saved us. He's our wisdom. He's our righteousness. He's our sanctification. He is our redemption. He's bought us. We are no longer our own. And so we live in faith in Christ and what he's done. And this is what the Spirit does. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would take what is mine and declare it to you. He would help believers grasp their inheritance who they are and whose they are and what they have. And he will, Jesus said in John 16, 14, he will glorify me. The spirit puts the spotlight on Jesus. He exalts Jesus. And so my third point this morning is that the people of the spirit possess God's spirit and his perspective. We possess God's spirit Verse 12, and now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. You see, when, when Christians fight for position and they operate in competition, they're just trying to get their piece of the pie and scoot others out of the way so they can get their part. They're acting like orphans instead of beloved sons and daughters of God who've been given everything. Everything that they need that pertains to life and godliness. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And, and, and Paul goes on to, to tell, tell them this at the end of chapter uh, 3. Uh, he says, all things are yours. Like you got everything that you need. Quit, quit trying to operate in a worldly way with an orphan mentality. You've been blessed. And so this is always, this is helpful for me. The spirit of God reminds me of this at times when I feel like I'm lacking or at times when I feel like I don't have what I need. Okay. The reality is we do. Because we have him. Now, yeah, all of us go through some really hard times. And we need community. And, and we need a number of other things. But ultimately, we have what we need in him to be content. We have what we need right now to do his will. 
And I think it's not realizing that, not living with that awareness that gets us into a lot of trouble like the Corinthians. And so we possess the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. I, I want you guys this morning, saints, I want you to leave this place encouraged, exhilarated by the reality that you have the third person of the Trinity dwelling inside of you to be with you to comfort you, to lead you, to teach you, to empower you, to guide you into the will of God, to glorify Jesus, to live lives that put the spotlight on Jesus. I want you to leave encouraged that you have the Spirit of God to empower you to be faithful spouses to your husband or your wife. You have the Spirit of God living inside of you to empower you to be faithful parents to your children or faithful in your workplace, a faithful witness in your workplace. God has given us what we need in Christ. And the Spirit helps apply and help us understand and help us grasp and live out this Christian life. To try to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit, as I believe C.S. Lewis said, is like trying to breathe without oxygen. Like God, God has called us truly to be spiritual people. God has called us to live lives that are led by and marked by the Spirit of God. In verse 16, Paul says, For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Wow. We have the mind of Christ. And, of course, it's the Holy Spirit who helps us grasp that and helps us understand the mind of Christ and empowers us to live from and operate in a mode that is synced with that perspective, the mind of Christ. D.L. Moody said that the Christian on his knees sees more than the philosopher on tiptoe. God sends no one away empty except those who are full of themselves. The Christian on his knees sees more than the philosopher on his tiptoe. Jesus gloried in this reality about God, the Father. Remember, I shared this a few weeks ago. Uh, after the disciples came back from a mission trip and they saw some, they saw some fruit, they saw some responses. And, uh, and, and Jesus just is like, he rejoiced in the Father. You might say he boasted in the Father. He exulted in the Father that he said, I thank you that you hide yourself from those who consider themselves wise and prudent, the worldly wise, but you've revealed yourselves to babes. Like Jesus delighted in that. Or as Paul talked about, he takes the weak things of the world to confound or shame the, the wise, the weak, the, confound the strong or confound the, 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 the uh, shame the strong or the the the, the unwise to confound the wise and just God, god's ways are amazing and and there's there's a kingdom paradox that the world just doesn't get the world just can't make sense of like christianity and the gospel and like why like okay so why would you not sleep around and you're not married well because god tells us that we're to live holy lives why would you not cheat the clock or, or, um, or, or try to get a deal that, why would you not compromise in business? You know, when you, when you, it's yours, you just gotta just get it. You don't have to say everything. You know, I, I was reminded of just thinking when I, when I first became a Christian, particularly when I was working at a job at TCBY Yogurt, I had a manager who was just encouraging me to do some immoral things, some things that were wrong. And, and I, I was a new Christian. And I had new convictions. And before, I would just go with the convictions of, I would, I would go with the flow, you know? But, but then I had become a Christian, and, and I, I just saw things different. I wasn't going to cheat the clock. I wasn't going to go try to get that girl's phone number because she was looking at me. Because I, I had become a Christian. I'm not looking for worldly things. I'm looking for Jesus. 
And so it doesn't make sense to the world. The Christian life doesn't make sense to the world because they, they, the, the natural man just sees this life and puts the emphasis on this life. But, but for us who are believers, people of the Spirit, we have the work of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit shaping who we are. We've been born again. We've been changed at the core. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. The old is past. Behold, all things are new. Our identity has changed. And no person can do that. No human being can change a per- another human being at the core, change a person's heart. But Jesus can do that. And the Spirit of God can do that. We see God breaking into the life of Saul of Tarsus, the, the terrorist, the killer of Christians, the persecutor of Christians, changing that hard heart. And he gets on fire for God. Now, now we have this Holy Scripture written from the Apostle Paul's hand, inspired by the Holy Spirit, because God broke in and changed him at the core of who he is. God makes us his children. He makes us new creation. The Spirit shapes and influences our perspective. Paul told the the Ephesians, he said, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit influence you. And the Spirit influences our practices. When we're following the Spirit, what's the fruit? Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Love, joy, joy. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I mean, who doesn't want to be around a person like that? Don't we want to work with people like that? Don't we want to live with people like that in our family? Don't we want our kids to be like that? Love, joy, peace, patience. Don't we want to be like that? Bringing sweetness to the lives of others. So the Corinthians consider themselves a spiritual people. The apostle Paul's concern, as Gordon Fee says, Paul's concern throughout is to get the Corinthians to understand who they are in terms of the cross and to stop acting as non-spirit people. Stop acting as non-spirit people. In chapter 3, verse 1, brothers, I brother, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh as infants in Christ. And so he's challenging their perspective. He's challenging them to take on spirit-imparted wisdom, divine wisdom. He casts vision for them throughout this letter of what it looks like to be a people of the Spirit. People of the Spirit depend upon God's power. People of the Spirit operate in God's wisdom. People of the Spirit cultivate holy lifestyles. People of the Spirit are motivated by love. People of the Spirit aim to exalt Christ and what they say, what they do, whether you eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. People of the Spirit center on the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a part of what unites us as Christians amongst our differences. I love when I look out and I just see diversity, ethnic diversity, age diversity, Socioeconomic diversity, as I've said, it's sad that on Sunday mornings that that, that is the most segregated time of the, the week. But it shouldn't be like that for Christians, especially if we live in a diverse city or, or community. We should reflect heaven on earth with every tribe and every tongue, folks from all kinds of different backgrounds. And what unites us is the gospel of Jesus Christ, our common faith in Jesus and our common mission to bring the gospel to the nations, to make disciples of all nations. And so Paul casts vision for what being a spirit, people of the spirit looks like. People of the spirit endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit. People of the spirit live in simple devotion to christ and so may god lead us work in us to be truly people of the spirit who demonstrate that who reflect that they misunderstood spirituality paul was teaching them true spirituality gordon fee says apparently they they thought of spirituality mostly in terms of ecstasy and experience now paul's not opposed to experience 
special experiences with God. I mean, he actually prayed in, in Ephesians chapter 3 that by the Spirit, the Ephesians would know the love of Christ, the depth and the width and the height and the length of God's love that passes knowledge. He wanted them to get it not just here, but like here and know the love of God. But the Corinthians seem to put more emphasis on these special experiences of ecstasy, which has led some of them to deny the physical body on the one hand and, and to have a sense of having arrived on the other. Gordon Fee goes on and he says, they, they considered Paul's preaching to be milk. On the contrary, he implies redemption through the cross comes from the profound depths of God's own wisdom which his spirit given to those who love him has searched out and revealed to us. Another writer describes true spirituality. He says that the spiritual person is one who lives out Christ crucified, which includes turning away from a life of excessive wealth and being ready to be despised or, or thought irre- irrelevant Uh, is necessary to promote God's reign. Oh, I'm sorry. The spiritual person is one who lives out Christ crucified, which includes turning away from a life of excessive wealth and being ready to be despised, or though irrelevant, is necessary to promote God's reign. And so we see a problem here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are folly to him. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. There's a problem for the natural person. What's the problem? We might just say you need Jesus. (laughs) You need Jesus, that's the problem. Sin's the problem, right? You need the Holy Spirit. You need your eyes open. There's, There's this inability to understand, but also there's this unwillingness to accept the things of God. Have you ever wondered, like, for those family members that you've been praying for and witnessing to for so long, like, why don't they just get it? Why don't they just see Jesus as glorious and beautiful as he really is? Like, my eyes are open. I see value and beauty and worth in Christ. Why don't they get it? Why? I've told them a number of times. I've, I've showed them. I've tried to show them what it looks like, the contrast between before Christ and after Christ. Why don't they get it? Why, why isn't it sinking in, into their lives and changing them? One theologian says that human ears cannot hear high-frequency radio waves. Deaf men are unable to judge music contest blind men cannot enjoy beautiful scenery and that the unsaved are incompetent to judge spiritual things a most important practical truth the apostle paul speaks about this inability in second corinthians chapter 4 verses 3 and 4 he says even if our gospel is veiled it is veiled to those who are perishing in their case the god of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So there's spiritual blinders there. Satan has done his work. The God, the lowercase God of this world, he's blinded the minds. And then there's also hardness of heart and and a stubbornness and an unwillingness to accept the things of God. So there's this inability, this lack of perception, but there's also this unwillingness. The New American Standard does, does I think, a, a good job in, in bringing out what Paul is trying to say here. He says, but the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. I like that. That's helpful. Anybody ever bought or sold a house? You had to get it appraised. Right? So... Our, in our first house, we, we, we did that and, you know, we had somebody come and appraise the house and it was worth, you know, a hundred something thousand. We lived in it for five years. Market went up here in Dallas and it doubled or, or even almost tripled the, the value. 
And then, you know, if you're coming from California or out of state, you might even pay more, another 50000 more for, for that house. And so there's this, this, uh, um, this idea of appraising, this idea of, uh, idea of valuing. And it has to do with what, what's, what's somebody, what is somebody willing to pay for it? What is somebody willing to pay for the object? Right? There's a number of things that we, we may see that, that we wouldn't pay much at all for, for something. And I, I'm, I love a good deal. I love finding a good deal. My wife knows. And that is something I actually kind of, I do boast about sometimes. I was convicted recently. When I find a good deal, I'm just like, man, look at this. I got this great deal. Or I found this great thing on the side of the road or whatever. So I don't know. <laughs> but my heart, I'm like, God, thank you. This was from you. Like you, you led me to this great deal, you know. But we put values on things and, and we display what we value for something or someone by what we're willing to pay or what we're willing to do for that thing or for that person. And spiritual truths are, are not understood and they're not valued by the natural person. They don't appraise them very highly. They don't accept them. It's not worth their time. It's not worth the inconvenience to practice, to operate in a mode from that perspective of, of Christianity. And so it's rejected. It's not merely, uh, uh, um, uh, as, as Craig Bloomberg says, it's not mere, primarily a cognitive issue, but it's a volitional issue. Both. In understanding the gospel and coming to faith. And we as Christians, we get it. We understand that God valued us enough That he sent his son, Jesus, to die for us. And he's placed a value upon our lives. You've been bought at a price, Paul told the Corinthians. You're no longer your own. The precious blood of Jesus, the infinite worth of the life of Jesus Christ was poured out for you. And God saved us. Because he loved us, because of his own grace. He was acting according to his own purposes and plan. So I'm getting close to landing the plane here. Let me just share this quote from uh, A.W. Tozer who said, More spiritual progress can be made in one short moment of speechless silence in the awesome presence of God than in years of mere study. The exposure may be brief, but the results are permanent. When we encounter God, he changes us. And we can try, try to achieve change and achieve understanding in our own strength and lean on our own understanding and and strive in our own gifts and strive in our own ability. But what God has given to us in Christ is a gift of grace. That's received. It's it's something that's revealed by his spirit. It's something that he displays through Christ. So let me close with a couple points of application. Kevin, if you'd come on up. Ask God to fill you with his spirit and cultivate an awareness of his leading. When was the last time you asked God, fill me? Fill me with your spirit. We are to be a people of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit, bearing the fruit of the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit, being sensitive to the Spirit, not quenching the Spirit, dousing. dousing, uh, My my family and I were camping last week, and we had to put out the fire before we left, pour water on it. Paul says, don't quench the Spirit. Don't grieve the Spirit, Ephesians 4, through the way that you treat one another, through bitterness, unforgiveness. May we be a church that is filled with the Spirit of God, bearing the fruit of the Spirit of God. And be, be with God much, with your Bible open and your heart open, looking to Him to hear Him speak. See, the Holy Spirit is the one who inspired the Scripture. And being people of the Spirit doesn't mean that we're not people of the book. 
The two go together. Word people and spirit people. And unfortunately, oftentimes, that's, there's a division of that within different parts of the body of Christ. Some tend to emphasize one to the neglect of the other. But the Holy Spirit's the one who inspired the scripture. Second, Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scriptures, God breathed. The pneuma of God, the ruha of God, the breath of God, which can also be translated spirit. Spirit breathes and inspires. Peter says that, that he, he, the spirit moved upon, God moved upon holy men of old to, to write the things that they wrote. And so we believe that the spirit, that the Bible is a spirit inspired book. And so we read it, we immerse ourselves in this book. Because the spirit and the truth of scripture aren't contrary to one another. They work, they work together. And so be much with God, with your Bible open, your heart open to him. And lastly, do life with and learn from others who bear the fruit of the spirit, of God's spirit. God's given us his spirit, he's given us scripture, and he's given us the saints, other brothers and sisters to walk with who can impart wisdom. To, we can impart grace and wisdom to one another with our words. Like God uses us and he chooses, he chooses that, that, to, to, that our growth and spiritual maturity and development happen as we're together, not as we're isolated. I found that as I have been isolated from other Christians, I lack movement and growth in Christ-likeness. But the more I have a healthy relationship here with God, with the Spirit, with the Scripture, and with the saints, the more I move towards health, towards growth, and bear the life and the fruit of the Spirit. So before Kevin and the team leads us in a, in a song, a prayer song, would you all pray this prayer with me from Ephesians chapter 1? If you would stand up, let's pray this together. After the Apostle Paul unpacked, those wonderful things that God had given to the church, he prayed for them. And I want to take his words and, and pray for ourselves for this very thing. Pray with me. Father, grant us spiritual wisdom and revelation as we get to know you more. Open our eyes so that we would truly know the hope of your calling the wealth of your inheritance in us, and the greatness of your power that works towards us. And all God's people said, Amen.